So hi, my name is Callie Burke. I am here at Kennedy Space Center where I'm the space app lead um, in Florida. Uh, although my day job is just the Treasury Analyst for the Launch Services Program. I have Claire right with me and we're going to talk about what it's like to work in a lab and how wearables could help her in her job. And just so you know, all the KSC challenges, including the space wearable challenge, we have a panel of Kennedy experts who review the videos of any projects that commit to this challenge. So Kennedy Space Center is going to hold our own judges for, uh, judging for our challenges and actually award a prize to top projects um, for each of our different challenges. And this is separate from the global judging. So even if you um, if you work on, a sp on space wearables or any of the Kennedy challenges, even if you're not nominated for global judging, we'd love it if you could go ahead and make a video for your project and any other uh, requirements that global judging has. So, and so we're going to get started with the Q&A. And so you can either submit questions with the Q&A feature here on Google Hangouts um, use the hashtag space wearables on Twitter, or else you can put them on the hashtag. So, and, oops. Right, do we have anyone in the chat? So, to make sure we have the sound, although we're pretty sure it's everything's good. All right. So, hi, Clara. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Hi, Kelly. So why don't you um, just introduce yourself? Well, I am Claire Wright. I'm a materials engineer at Kennedy Space Center. I've been here about 10 years, and I work in a materials lab, uh, primarily failure analysis is what we started out doing, but it actually involves more than just looking at things that fail. We also look at materials that, whether we want to try to use them for future vehicles or launch structures, uh, any problems that we're having with the material that has already been selected. across the state center, right, in, as far as lab work? We pretty much get materials from anywhere in, in the space center. We work a lot with, with all the other labs. We have a number of labs, at least 50 labs here at Kennedy Space Center. Um, we, yes, I do get to work with those people and get to see what capabilities we have out here. Uh, but in, in terms of our materials lab, we, we are often working with all kinds of disciplines in uh, whatever material issue comes up. And it could be a range from behind me. I have some failed pipes that you can see there. Uh, sometimes it's facility, sometimes it's a launch structure, sometimes it's flight hardware, experiments on the space station, a launch vehicle that's ready on the pad that, that something happened with contamination. There's just a lot of things that we can look at. Cool. So what does a typical day look like for you? Typical day, well, um, the lab work have, kind of has to be scheduled in a sense because we need a lot of pre-meetings you need to understand what the issues are, talk to the engineers who work with these materials on a day-to-day -day basis, the so design engineers. Um, we need to look at all of the requirements that we have, that's a whole lot set of requirements, and we need to understand how we're going to have a plan of action. And I think that this is where space wearable should be, um, a wearable technology would be really important. And as we're starting to plan, that for example, we have failure analysis, we need to understand how we're going to approach that very systematically. We can't just come in here and start looking at material. So all of that pre-planning has to happen. Um, then we come in and do whatever lab work we have scheduled for that day, go back and, and give the results to whoever brought in the fee. Um, so each day is very different. That's more of a generic how we, we would do the process. And um, we go back and forth between the office and the lab quite a bit. Okay. We have a question from Thorsten. And so um, he's asking what your current assignment is. So you, so you talked about the failure analysis. So what are some of your, your specific assignments? Or I am a materials and processes engineer. And uh, I wish I could give you one quick answer, but I really can't. Right now we're working a lot with uh, any launching. Uh, we have some small payloads, for example. So right now I'm working on a, on a plant habitat project, which we're designing and developing here at Kennedy to fly to space station and do experiments at space station. So I help out with making sure that we have all of the right materials to make sure that we procure everything we need to make this, uh, this little science, science experiment. And not little, actually. It's pretty big as a facility. And um, so that's just one. I have about 10 different things like that that I'm working on and, and trying to make sure that the right materials are being used and try to make sure that anytime we need to uh, do a material analysis that we get it done correctly here in the lab. Great. Um, What kind of interruptions is, what might you encounter when you're working in a lab? Something that, stops, you know, that might ha ha cause you to stop having to work? Oh, that happens all the time. We have 
a number of people that come in through the lab. Depending on which lab you are, you can have 10 people working at once. You can have just one. So if something else comes up, there's a question. Um, we have a group walking through because it's a safety audit. We have a tour. Anything like that could happen as we're in the middle of doing a task. And um, I don't know if you want to talk about this tally or not, but yeah. we do have uh, lab notebooks that we see. And this is where it just depends on the person's person how detailed they want to be about writing down what they're doing, what their observations are. And sometimes if you're not careful and you get interrupted in the middle of that, then you might not catch something. So we rely on uh, each person has their own kind of technique to do it. We also have a lot of safety requirements that we always need to keep in the back of our mind. And the more experienced you are, the less you have to go back and look through all the safety documentation. But for those who are starting out, for example, we have an intern that's just starting. We, as a more uh, senior engineer, have to sit with them a lot and make sure that, first of all, they know how to operate the equipment, they're doing it correctly, but also that they're doing it safely. And so we, we do have some procedures. Sometimes it's just a piece of paper. Sometimes it's a booklet. Sometimes it's um, formalized training that we have to do before we use a piece of equipment. OK, so you have basically almost self interruptions to record or review procedures or safety material. That's right. And then the people who come and just want to start talking about they have a question, <laughs> generic question about bad practices or uh, things like that. So yeah, it's often interrupted. Oh yeah, so that's a knowledge transfer where they're trying to make knowledge sure that transfer. they understand what's going on, which may happen in the middle of a task. That's right. So. Well, how did you learn how to operate the equipment that you work with? The, sometimes you just have to start using the equipment. So you start out by using a user's manual. If you are lucky enough to have the vendor come in and train, so we have some pieces of equipment here that are $100,000, $200,000, and you don't want to just put somebody new to start using that piece of equipment. We want them to be trained. So we have the, the people who sell us the equipment, the vendors, come in and give us a brief overview, and then we start doing a lot of hands-on work. There are certain pieces of equipment in our materials labs where you can transfer knowing how to use uh, a microscope, for example, a scanning electron microscope. You can learn how to use one and then transfer that knowledge a little bit if you have a different brand or a different type of microscope. But there are some that are so unique that you want to make sure that you follow everything correctly and that you don't ruin a $200,000 piece of equipment. That would be a bad day. Now, um, as we start working our procedures, then we write down some of the what it takes to, to work to use the equipment. And um, then we rely on, like I said, we either have to write down our procedure of how to take a hardness reading or how to do a uh, montage of images. And uh, kind of in the lab, we try to help each other out. Different people learn how to use a piece of equipment, and then we train each other. And um, more importantly, somebody who's never used a piece of equipment before has to come in and do all of those. They can even get a user's manual. Sometimes they're really sick, or they're on the computer itself now that we're more, more modern than that. But we still have some old manuals for the older pieces of equipment. And you have to sit in and really just start looking at the features and really understand what you're going to use. Okay. Um, so there are times when those so those pipes aren't they don't uh, you know they don't fail in your lab they fail in the field. Do you have to go out in the field very often? Yes, we do. We have a lot of photo of, of documentation is what we call it where we go out to the field. We have a whole kit and actually I can get that out if you want me to yeah. it really quick. Yeah, okay. let me go get it. Okay, luckily it's close one. <laughs> um, we have a full, it says here, failure analysis field kit. And inside of that, if I were to start taking out, we have things such that we always need to, when we take pictures, we have a scale bar so that we know. When you take a picture, you don't know if you're looking at something that's as, as small as a coin or as large as, um, no, whatever it may be. You're, you need to get an idea of the size scale. So we always put a scale bar next to that, some kind of ruler with the, the right dimension. We always have things to tag. Um, so we have little tags too that we need to go and take samples back. We have all kinds of sampling equipment. We have uh, permanent markers. We have plastic bags, containers, mirrors. If there's an area where you can't reach it, for example, we have a piece of pipe and we want to look inside of it. We have specialized equipment for that too. It wouldn't necessarily fit in this kit, but we have a separate one. We have a portable microscope that we take out. Um, the idea is always to treat any failure at the crime scene is what I always call it. It's to serve as much evidence as possible. And that's what we try to do. But by having these field kits, we, all, we are able to do that. Okay. 
Well, I mean, as you mentioned, safety is a big deal. So how, how, how does your safety differ when you're in the field versus in the lab? Safety equipment and, and your way yeah, you, have, you handle yourself. You know what, I have some examples of, for people who don't work in the lab, they don't realize that a glove is not a glove. So we have all different types of gloves. Um, if you're going to be handling this material, like corroded pipes, you don't want to get that corrosion on yourself. Then you just use regular cotton gloves. If you use leather gloves, you're going to be doing something like soldering or welding, or if you have something that might be high temperature. Then if you're using one of the, um, if you're cutting, we have Kevlar gloves. And so you need to make sure that you use the correct one. So if you're using, we use liquid nitrogen, so that's cryogenic, very, very cold temperatures. So you, have, you need an insulated glove. And then if we're dealing with chemicals, then we have chemically resistant gloves. So it just depends on what you're going out to use, whether you choose one of these gloves. And then here in the lab, we have this regular lab glove. Uh, I don't have, yeah, I don't have a box of those nearby. Um, so another example, you're asking about the field versus not. If you're going to be doing any cutting or anything, you can use uh, safety glasses. In, in the lab, you can also have a shield. But if you're particularly in the lab and you have a, a laser microscope, which we do have, then you have to use specialized laser glasses. So we have to know, we call this PPE, personal protective equipment. And you have to know what to use for each application, whether it's specialized microscope, such as a laser microscope, or if you're grinding something, and you need to use that face shield. So, so since this is just face wearables, and we're looking at how, how they might interest people doing, doing research or just, or just work in general that's physical, um, if you, you know, if you had a magic wand and people with, you know, some of the current technology, what are some wearables you wish that you could use right now, or things where you think people might be able to help you out? I think it would be great to have, so a lot of labs require the use of safety glasses, and some of our labs here at KSC, you have to wear them regardless of what you're doing in the lab. As soon as you step through that door, the lab manager has decided that they want that to be, to ensure that everybody in the lab is wearing the safety glasses, because then if they have to mix chemicals or something, they already have them on. So you're always wearing the safety glasses. So it would be great to have, if you forget your lab notebook, or if you, if you forget your procedure, or if you don't have a written procedure, but you could have somebody put it in, and you could have a wearable where you could have your procedure right in front of you. I think that would be great. Do you have any tasks where you, you know, you, you record it in the notebook what happens, but you wish that you could just record physically what you see? That would be great, too, yes. Yeah. And one of the things, you know, we had, um, our, our offices are actually down the stairs and down the hall, and if you've never been to Kennedy Space Center, our buildings are huge. They are very, very long buildings, so it could take five minutes to walk um, over from the lab. And we, a lot of our lab equipment is not networked. So that means that if you forget your memory stick or if you forget a, uh, a CD, if we still have a machine where you have to burn a CD, and you forget your lab notebook and you had your notes from yesterday, you know, we have to walk all the way back and then bring it all the way over. If you forgot your memory stick and you want to save some images and take it back to your office, then you have to do that walk back and forth. And there was one point in time where we were actually in a different building. And there are people here who currently they work in a different building from where their lab is. Some of them have to even drive where the lab is. So to forget something like that can be a really uh, detrimental and it's not very efficient to not have that with you. Okay. And these lab notebooks, yeah, it would be great where you could just not even have to worry about your lab notebook. You had it with you, where, whatever that technology was, that you, it, it could be a digital form. Yeah. And, um, and then if you could be given information um, when you're learning the equipment. When you're learning the equipment and um, if somebody else has used the equipment and they can just send you their procedure for doing something basic, just taking a picture on a microscope that uses a laser, but you have to follow certain steps, it would be great that you don't have to go find that person. You can just flip through their notes and say, oh, yeah, this is how they were able to image this particular step. Yeah. Well, you've been at Kennedy almost 10 years. What are some of the more interesting failures you've, you've investigated? I've had some really cool failures, actually. I, say, I always say I've had... The pressure of, of working with things that only a handful of people have been able to touch in the world. And um, one of the more interesting ones that I always like to talk about is there was a, a failure on space station that um, required a team of, I think, about 200 people in there. So we were the first ones, because we were at Kennedy Space Center, we were the first ones to receive the samples from space station, do the whole failure analysis, and turn around the information within a matter of a day. So the whole team stayed overnight. We worked really hard to try to figure out 
what had happened. Um, it was when we were in the construction of space station, and one of the solar array turning mechanisms was having issues. And it wasn't a full failure where it it um it stopped space station from you know from being able to being operable since it was during the construction stages. It was just that we had something in the design that didn't work as it was supposed to work. And so that turning mechanism for the solar arrays wasn't working correctly. But we were able to figure out what was going on with the material and with the team at Johnson Space Center at Marshall and everywhere else at NASA and the contractor team, we were able to come up with a mitigation technique that those solar arrays are fine now. But we have samples that have been taken out in space. I have space uh, gloves, that they're called EVA gloves, that I show when I go to school and things like that. But so it was more, more of the cool factor of I've been able to work on something that was out of space. Mm -hmm. And we have those samples sitting here in the lab. Very cool. So, and we'll, we'll speaking of the space station stuff, have you gotten to work personally with any of the astronauts? Oh, yes, I have. There are a number of astronauts who are materials engineers, and we've done some investigations with uh, a few astronauts, and that we still keep in touch and still talk uh, on a professional level, I would say. But um, there was a point in time where we were doing a lot of work to ensure crew survival. They were looking at Columbia debris after the accident. They were making sure that we could learn as much as we could, so that way it would never happen again. And we had a, a team of astronauts who came in here and led that investigation. How would a crew have survived? And what lessons do we have um, from from the accident itself? And I was able to support that investigation and work hand on hand. And a neat thing about that is that now I'm just friends with one of these astronauts. And when he was uh, when he went to the space station, when he had his flight, once we got when we turned to flight, and we were going back and forth to the station, uh, I was one of the people he put in a distribution to talk about his experience of being in space for the first time and how he saw the Earth from space. So it was really cool to see that and, and get that perspective of a first-time astronaut. I wish I could be up there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think, yeah, definitely a sentiment shared by many of us, including me. Um, so real quick, we're going to do a tour of your lab, but before that, can you just mention what is your, your educational background to get to where you are? I'm, to get hired? I said I was a materials engineer, engineer, which means I went through materials engineering curriculum at University of Florida for a bachelor's and then Penn State for my master's. And a lot of people don't know materials engineer as an engineering as a field, but it is a very important field and you can choose specialties. I chose a metal specialty. So if you've ever heard the term metallur metallurgist, uh, metal engineer, forensics engineer is another one for failure analysis. So that would all kind of describe what I do. And then in NASA terms we call it a materials and processes engineer or an M and P engineer. Great. All right. So we will start the the tour now. So we're going to use this computer. So if you want to get up, and I'm going to do it for a minute. We're going to I'm going to switch the microphones real quick. You guys can still hear us. All right. I think. Um, okay, I'm not sure if that works, so I'm actually going to go back to using your... Alright, alright, we should be good. So, have to share show time. Okay. Let's see, I'll show you kind of briefly what we have to share out of the way. Uh, we, have a type. we have a lot of microscopes, so what we have over here is called a stereo microscope. And we kind of pan across the room. In the back, we have a photography area, so that gray stuff that you see there is a curtain area where we take a lot of photographs when we get a failed piece or a piece that we want to investigate. And then if you come over here, we have our um, digital microscope. And we can do reconstruction. So these are the ones that expensive microscopes, and you know, I'm not really trying that, but that's what it looks like. Yeah, it takes some training to use that. Then we have that right here. This is this piece of equipment. It's a hardness tester. This is one of the ones where you can even see we have some procedures handwritten on the side there because it's not trivial to take a, a hardness measurement. You have to really understand the equipment. Feel free to adjust the laptop if I'm not getting the right angle. <laughs> it looks in here it might be a little noisy, but this is what we call our scanning electron microscope. You see it here. And so this is very generic for a materials lab, but this is one of those very expensive pieces of equipment that um, is used to look at materials at high magnification, so looking at them at uh, 10,000 times magnification. Whereas the other microscope that I showed you, the first one I showed you, the stereo microscope. 
microscope with maybe 30x magnification, and then the digital microscope that I showed you goes up to maybe a thousand x magnification. This particular microscope can go up to 10,000, up to 100,000 times magnification. So it needs those electron beams in order to get an image. Can we look at it closer? Or? We can get a little closer. Let's see it. I don't have it open or anything, but this is a vacuum chamber, and you put your sample inside of there, and then. Coming out of it, you have some of the detectors that are used to look at composition, elemental composition. And actually, this picture here is an example of how you can color code a material or a sample to different elements that are present. So that's what we do. We take an image, black and white, and then we can color code it based on what elements are present. Um, and then we have some other detectors to give us different kind of imaging techniques. This one takes a lot of experience to be able to do, and this is one where we don't just let anybody walk in. <laughs> we need to have a uh, background in being able to register. Yeah. It doesn't look like what I used in high school. There's <laughs> a little bit more here. Okay. This is going to do material preparation, and you're going to see some of our corroded pieces and sales pieces. We have all kinds of things. I wanted to show you this side. This is where we do sample preparation, where we take an oscilloscope or something. Where let's say we have a fastener. Oh, let me make sure I get it. Yeah, a fastener has failed. We mount it in the phenolic, and then we polish it using different types of sandpaper. So that's some of the examples from the sandpaper that we have, from very coarse to very fine. And then we polish it. But what that allows us to do is to be able to look for cracks in the material. And this is a generic, again, generic material practice that a lot of materials labs do. But it, every time you use a different material, you might use a different polishing step. So if you turn over here, you can see some of our polishing wheels. This one, and this one, this one, this one. Um, the example, so in a sample holder, let's see if it's on, yeah. We drop this down, and uh, we put the sample in there, and we polish it. And depending on the material, this manufacturer, Okay. Manufacturer might have uh, what we call recipes of what polishing material to use for for each material, what polishing media to use. And some around here and have all different kinds of suspensions, diamond suspensions, to get to the right finish. So this is one area where um, we could maybe get the information from the vendor. I have to go online if I have if they have titanium. I've never done titanium before. I have to go to the vendor's website and get what their recommendations are and what kind of uh, patents we use on here and what kind of solutions we use. It would be if I could just have that information directly in front of me. Like I said, if I had something that I wore and it would tell me, oh yeah, for titanium, use 200 grit paper for five minutes with this pressure, do it um, two times, whatever that may be. So we program it all into the, the machine. So if we could just have that in front of us, it would save a lot of time right there. And um, these samples, we have another microscope back here. So all different types of microscopes, you see it have to be knowledgeable in different types of microscopes. This one's called a metallograph, it's inverted, so you would take this polished sample, put it on there, get a pair on here, and look at the material structure, make sure it was made correctly, and uh, make sure there's no flaws, no defects, porosity, anything like that. How often are you looking at, at what you're looking at for the microscope? How often are you looking with your naked eye versus with the computer? I mean, naked eye through the, through the equipment versus the computer. A lot of computer, a lot of microscopes are changing to digital, but they don't even have the IP pieces anymore. And you can see on this one, still has the IP. We have some of our um, more senior engineers prefer to still always first look in the IPs. And I also consider myself in that group, too. Uh, it's just a preference, but. Um, for this metallograph, it is always good to look through the eye pieces because you can move around the sample and go to the area of interest and then take the pictures. The, one of the first microscopes that I said that I kind of picked up the curtain and said, this is our digital microscope. You just put it there, you don't even have eye pieces. So you look through with the computer monitor and do it. So it's kind of split right now. So, well, we've seen a lot of corrosion out here. Kennedy, like many of the launch sites that NASA uses, is near the beach. Is corrosion a bigger deal here than in other places? Oh, definitely. We always have to make sure that we're protecting our materials so that we don't have corrosion failures. But, you know, we end up ultimately do because some of these structures have been here for 40, 50 years. And so um, inspection is very important to ensure that we don't have those failures. So we see a lot of corrosion out here. What do you do to protect um, 
after items come into the lab to make sure that they don't get damaged further to make sure that you're only seeing the original damage. We always wear gloves. I talked about uh, that PPE version of protective equipment. So we have to wear to make sure that we're handling everything correctly. Uh, this one I'm handling with my hands because it's just a demo piece. But we always tell people, don't touch it. You're going to transfer your oils onto it. So we think it's going to corrode. One of the things we do is do all of the analysis at the same time. And then um, I'll show you back here we have some desiccators. Okay. And um, so we keep our samples protected in something like this. Sometimes we do a nitrogen purge, sometimes we don't. And these are generic lab practices like I was talking about. So we keep, we keep them protected. Well, I think um, you said you, you have a personal protective equipment like kit cabinet. Oh, yeah. We can see that, and then maybe we'll finish up. Do you have other other projects to get to? So this is where we, we do have some list of what kind of personal protective equipment. Um, but what you can see in here, hard hat, we have steel toe shoes, all the different gloves that I was talking about. Um, and then we have some hearing protection. Yeah, more hard hats, our vision, a respirator, all the safety glasses. So, and you're wearing a hard hat. Um, when we go to our construction area or to the launch pad, when we're shuttle days, we have to wear a hard hat when we're out at the uh, launch pad. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go back over here. So. So I just wanted to say thank you to Clara for taking the time to join us, and we look forward to seeing everyone's face wearables for projects. So as I mentioned, if you're doing a project, we really would love to see our videos. We will be having people who work on space wearables here kind of viewing those videos, getting the chance to see your project. Um, anything else you want to say, Claire? No, as long as there's no other questions, thank you for your time. All right. Well, actually, here, we'll do a real quick check, and then we'll, we'll stop with our cast. Okay. So now it's your time. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in. Doesn't look like we have any, so I'm going to stop the broadcast. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We appreciate it.